this, this thing. Uh, yeah, this is gonna be. So, uh, why can't I do this last week? <laughs> okay. You can see that it's actually recording. How <laughs> did I used to do this? Every week it's like your first time. It's like losing virginity every single week. Okay, and clapper and we begin. We start. <laughs> there is something so comforting about me wearing my Britney shirt, you know, Britney from the young days. There is something so comforting. If you watch on YouTube, you know that I have this background because it's my happy place. It's where I record. Everything is okay here. Crime doesn't happen. It's just like a coping mechanism when you talk about the most gruesome things. You can also see that there is a Bev in the shot, like I have one this week, and I'm not really satisfied with this one. It kind of fizzled out, because if you noticed how I speak, you might not be surprised to know that I move <laughs> equally retardedly. <laughs> in a way that, you know, I jump up and down, like <laughs> it's one move in one second, the other the other second, so this kind of booze, you know, moved a lot in the back, and it feels out. First world problems. My people have died in your story, okay? It's it's true crime podcast, which reminds me, hi, my name is Maya. <laughs> this is by all means necessary. It is a serious medium. It is a light-hearted true crime podcast where every week I sit on my fat ass, I tell you a story about an expression. Yeah, that part doesn't make much sense. I tell you a story about an expression and the origin of the expression because I'm all about spreading knowledge about true crime, but also about something that is dear to my heart, and that is the English language. Okay, this is why you cannot be taken seriously. And if you are into that combination, or if you are just into one or the other, make sure you consider subscribing and you follow me on the socials, that BAM pod across the internet, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Patreon. I also have a YouTube channel under my husband's name so that high school people don't find me. That will be in the description box as well. And you can follow me there for even more of a true crime fix, because there's at least one other piece of content that you don't get on the podcast podcast there. Boom. Now that I spelled that out for you. Let's go into the expression of the day. You know, now when I'm on the other side of this podcasting thing and I'm not just like the consumer of the content, I often picture how do people consume my podcast as in do they listen to just the expression? Do some people just tune for this ridiculous intro to see what the hell is going to come out of my mouth every single week? Or do people just follow the timestamps in the description and they just jump to the case and they're like, yep, cool, just the case, this is what I'm here for, fucker expression, passion and stuff like that. And then they just exit the video. You can also let me know. Yeah, you can email me, podbam at gmail.com. This is the most professional social media round I have done to this day. Wow. You know, it really can sometimes take 72 episodes. <laughs> the expression of the day. Let's get into the mood. Okay. The expression of the day is crying over spilled milk. Rather, again, this expression is used in the negative form. Don't cry over spilled milk. Like, there's no point. Crying over spilled milk, you dumb bitch. Okay. <laughs> okay. And what it means is that there is no use worrying about past events, about stuff that happened. Because this is the ancient version of the expression, the modern day version sounds something like... It is what it is. It is, it is what it is. <laughs> that will not land as a joke, but you will still try. You will still try. <laughs> the next slide here. Oh god, I forget when I write these credits. <laughs> the next slide says... It's spilled. It's on the floor, looking like cum overload. Who hurt you? Who hurt you? <laughs> when have you seen the cum overload? <laughs> it seems like spilled milk. I'm not okay. I am not okay. <laughs> okay, so now that that vision is in your head, um, this expression it has a really weird origin. It comes... It comes. Stop it. Stop it. You're 28 years old. You're more mature than this. Okay. So this expression comes from fairy lore. 
Because, I don't know if you guys knew, but in the days when people believed in fairies strongly, they believed that they existed, it was also common to lay out a shrine for these fairies. And these shrines consisted of small quantities of food and milk. Particularly, people honed on somehow, I don't know how many food and milk portions they have left behind, but they have figured out that milk is fairies' favorite drink. So whenever these people would just leave a bit extra milk, they would spill a bit extra milk, you could really say. Well, they thought nothing of it, because they were like, okay, it's just a bit extra offering to the fairies. We treat fairies right. Fairies treat us right. Yeah. <laughs> In written form, actually, it was first used by a British historian, James Howell, in 1659. And the first expression used was no weeping for shed milk instead of spilled milk. And that is because, as this article tells us, the verb spill itself has quite an interesting history and didn't really mean what it means today. Because the word spill came from the word spillen, Kind of like a villain, but without the eye in it. So, spillen meant to destroy, to kill, to mutilate. Imagine if spill meant the same, like Jesus. I mean, spilling somebody's guts kind of still means the same. So, yeah, but that's because there's guts in the expression, Maya. Okay, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. So, as you know, we have lost the violent sense of the word, but we still use spill for saying spilling blood spilling guts, and as well as milk, water, other liquids. Now on to the case portion of this video, because I'm all for not crying over spilled milk, but sometimes the histories and the wars that have happened between the countries just don't really allow for that, do they? Everybody's there just listening like, Maya, say what? Are we just going to have a drunk history lesson? Yes. Yes, you are. Because for you to understand the case of the day, we need to go a bit into the background of relationships between Okinawa in Japan and US through history. So this is going to be, again, history for dummies, wars for dummies. So don't expect like miracles. All right. All right. Today's story brings us to Japan, and as I put here in the script, because everybody sees the map of the world the same way as I do, you see Japan as the extension to the world, right? This is how people see it, you know, it's like, wow, the little link of islands, yeah? And Okinawa is the bottom of that link of the islands, it's like a couple of islands at the bottom of Japan. But what you probably didn't know, even if you have heard of Okinawa, is that there are 32 US military bases on Okinawa Island itself. Which means that they cover about the fourth of the land of the island. And of course, there is a reason for that. It all starts in my little history wrap-up of this part of the world with Japan, who in the beginning of the 20th century really wanted to expand. And they kind of have gone the aggressive way about it. So they have had two successful wars against China in 1894, and then there was a Russo-Japanese war in 1904. And then, of course, Japan successfully participated in the First World War alongside the Allies. So everything seemed to be on the rise for them until the Great Depression of the 1930s. And this is when the Japanese suffered through the economic and also some demographic struggles because they tried to force their way into China and expand by force again. And also what they have decided to do, what you know mostly from history and from the beginning of the Second World War, is that they decided to destroy the base of Pearl Harbor, because this would mean that Japan is going to control the Pacific. And if they control the Pacific, that pretty much means that they can breach into the Western countries and have even more control there. So at the time, Pearl Harbor was the main base for the Pacific fleet, 
And what the Americans didn't expect was the Japanese strategy was to attack Hawaii first. So that meant people are going to leave Pearl Harbor relatively undefended, which would make it an easy target. So they just sent some forces to attack like another place, while the majority of the forces were left at Pearl Harbor because that was the target for the attack. Kind of like Trojan horse trying to outsmart each other. Do you ever feel weird about this part of history that wasn't really so far ago, like Like our grandparents kind of lived through it. That was just about battles, wars, possessing like each other's land. And you're like, wow. And today it's like, hey, who's going to beef with whom on Twitter? Who's going to get the most likes? You're like, the meaning of power has truly changed for history, hasn't it? Now, of course, when Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor, well, the US wasn't just going to keep silent. They then had to declare war on Japan. And because the Japanese were good with the Allies and on the side of the Allies throughout First World War, well then now Nazi Germany declared war on the US. And this is what brought the US into the Second World War. Here, because the US was truly a Scorpio and they were all about playing the long game and waiting for their revenge, they knew that they were just brewing for the next four years before the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened in 1945. But even before August of 1945, when these bombings took place, there was one particular battle that people don't usually speak about when... World War II is the topic. And that was the major battle of World War II, better named as the Battle of Okinawa. This battle involved the Navy's 5th Fleet and more than 180,000 U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps descending on the Pacific island of Okinawa for one final push towards occupying Japan. Because you see, if they were to win the Battle of Okinawa, that would make U.S. closer to Japan. And then if they occupy the capital, of course, then they can basically colonize and occupy all of these other islands. And there is a name for what they were doing here, which is leapfrogging, also known as island hopping, which is the military strategy that they were applying here. Because if they reach Okinawa, then they're very much closer to Japan than if they were to breach like another territory. And then they can leave the military base on all of these islands and they can have 25% maybe of all of these territories and just breach into Japan and kind of colonize it really. Yeah, let's kind of call it for what it is. What became public after the Battle of Okinawa was just how much damage it was done and how tactical it was played. Americans lost about 5,000 men that were killed or drowned. They have lost some ships. They had around the same amount of men that were wounded and they have lost some aircraft. But Okinawa suffered even bigger losses because it was estimated that there were between 40k and 150k victims that were killed. And not just that, but most Japanese troops and Okinawa citizens believed that during this battle, Americans didn't take people as prisoners, so that they are going to be killed on the spot if captured. And as a result, it's not even so much that they were killed, like yes, majority of them was killed by the Navy forces, by Americans, but a ton of them actually chose death by suicide, including the general and the chief of staff that committed rituals suicide on June the 22nd, ending the Battle of Okinawa. So for the Americans, winning the battle put the Allied forces within striking distance of Japan. But wanting to bring the war to the smooth end and knowing that they're still outnumbered because there was about 2 million Japanese troops just awaiting battle, well, the president at the time chose to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August the 6th. And because the Japanese forces refused to give in, then on August the 9th, bombing on Nagasaki happened. That second bombing finally made the emperor of Japan surrender, which ended the Second World War. Now, why did I just walk you through like the whole freaking history of Okinawa? It is important for you to understand where the relations between Okinawans and the Americans stood at the time of this particular story of the day. 
So the situation pretty much was that the Americans controlled a lot of Japanese affairs until 1969, when the Japanese prime minister visited Washington, and he agreed with Richard Nixon, the president of the U.S. at the time, to return Okinawa to Japan so that it's not controlled by the American forces by 1972. Then the agreement was signed and Okinawa returned to Japan, but if you remember, still about the fourth of Okinawa was occupied by the U.S. forces, by the Navy and the Marines. So this agreement in 1972 didn't mean shit to Okinawans because they still kept protesting and complaining about different issues caused by the American military bases on their territory. So what we have here now is, yes, okay, the war is over, but then Americans still control so much territory. And not just that, but Japanese noticed that there were still a lot of nuclear weapons and just nuclear ammunition that the Americans had, and they didn't want another Battle of Okinawa to happen. They didn't want another Hiroshima and Nagasaki to happen. So they just constantly tried to reach agreements for these nuclear weapons to be removed off the base. So they tried to compromise for about 40 years since 1972, and they kind of reached some form of agreement again in 2013. And this agreement was reached to move the Marine Corps to the less densely populated area in Okinawa. So it's like, okay, cool. Now Americans still control all of their bases, but yeah, we're just going to move a bit towards like where there is less people. So if something blows up, you know, at least there are not that many casualties. Man, the way Americans think about life and just about nuclear weapons and having them everywhere, it's just, it's just not safe. It's just the same like with gun control. It's just eliminate the fucking problem to its roots. Go to the roots and cut them out. But the presence of nuclear weapons wasn't really at the forefront of people's minds because there were two other incidents that really infuriated Okinawans. One of them was the Okinawans rape incident from 1995. In this incident, there was this 12-year-old Okinawan schoolgirl, and she was just on her way home after going to the stationery store, just getting some paper, getting some notebooks. And as she was walking home, three men intercepted her way, and they kidnapped her, they bound her with duct tape, and then beat and violently raped her before disposing her in this remote field. Later in trial, it came to light that this was very much premeditated and that they have committed this act just for fun. And all three men belonged to the U.S. military. So when they went on base, at first actually the U.S. military tried to protect them from being prosecuted under the Japanese law. But eventually they were handed over and they served some time in Japanese prisons. They served like some small ass time. The maximum that they could have gotten for this crime, which is so bizarre, is 10 years under the law. But two men, Jill and Harp, were given seven years imprisonment, and the third man, Ledet, actually received six and a half years. All three men were released in 2003, and then were given other than honorable discharge from the military. And of course, all three of them complained how bad they had it in prison, and how they were forced into slave labor. And the second event that happened actually only a month before the one we're going to talk about today was when a 24-year-old U.S. Navy sailor, Justin Castellanos, was accused of a sexual assault of a woman who was asleep at the hotel. And he only received two and a half year prison sentence. So Kinawans here are already fueled with rage, and one event that we are going to focus on right now is going to reverse all of the relations that Americans and Okinawans worked so hard to build forever. On the 28th of April, Rina Shimabakuro was last seen just before she went out for a walk. Three weeks later, the police will get a hold of her killer, Kenev Shinzato. Once they manage to track down his car and match Rina's DNA with the DNA inside it. His confession will lead the police to the suitcase in the middle of the forest that will prove that military murders in Okinawa are far from over. What were his motives? (laughs) 
Around 8 p.m. on April the 28th, 2016, Rina goes out for a walk. She was using this messaging app called Lime to message back and forth with her boyfriend and her messaging app showed that she read the text from the boyfriend but then has just left it on scene, has just left it as read and never responded. And the boyfriend started panicking. She wasn't coming home. She didn't have her wallet on her. So he decided, okay, let's wait during the night. Maybe she appears. Maybe she just got somewhere and didn't tell me that she went out to visit friends but then the next morning he's like this is out of character for her she wouldn't have just walked out on me so he reports her missing the police started looking immediately because they suspected that she was probably a victim of a crime or has had an accident because she didn't go by car. She left her car behind and also she left her wallet behind. Like, where is she going to go without having any money on her? And her phone GPS showed them that she was last seen in this industrial area. So again, not really a place that she would have been familiar with. Now, over the next few weeks, her friends go all over social media, they make posts about her disappearance, and people started gossiping. Like, there were gossips about this on the internet. Some people thought she must have been abducted by a religious cult. Like, why else would she just have left this abruptly? Other people, of course, were like, well, it's always the boyfriend, it's always the husband, it's always the person close by. Random crimes just don't really happen, which is kind of true. While that is happening, the police is circulating the missing persons flyers. And they used her GPS data to try to triangulate even better her actual location. And they find that it was in this industrial zone near the river. So they went to like all of the businesses near the river and they went through their CCTV. And they were combing through the CCTV footage through hundreds and hundreds of cars, seeing if any of these people had criminal record, seeing if any of these people that owned any of these cars maybe were spotted with Rena. And as one of these police officers was just coming through this footage, they were like, wait, 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 wait. I think we have something here. There is this guy that was spotted in a shop just as Rina was inside and his car was in this location. So maybe we have something to work here because we don't have any better leads. So let's just try to find this guy's SUV and to see if we can just bring him in for questioning. Like, who can it hurt? except the guy if he is the perpetrator. You got that part. And I don't even think that they would have brought him in if the footage that they have seen wasn't like the most suspicious fucking thing you can find on the internet. So the footage that they have is this guy just kind of walking the same route where Rina was walking. And then shortly after, they can't track the two of them like together, but they see this man going into a shop, buying only salt, then getting out, opening his car door, and it seems like he was just sprinkling salt inside the car. And they were like, what the, what? Why is he sprinkling salt inside his car? So they bring him in and the police tells him, like, we're just going to swab your car for DNA and we're going to analyze, like, the material inside it. Just because you look hella sus. But by this point, it's been already three weeks. They aren't really hopeful to find much because, well, even if this had happened, he could have cleaned his car 20 times over by this point. They bring him in and this is his story. On the evening of April 28, 2016, Rina went out for a walk. What she didn't realize, though, is that Kenneth Shinzato, a 32-year-old former member of the U.S. Marine Corps, already had a picture of Rina on his phone. Rina, by all accounts, was this friendly, good-natured girl who was really quiet, but then she would show off her dancing and her singing skills when she was out with her friends. And what we know is that that particular night, around 8 p.m., she texted her boyfriend that she was gonna go for a walk, she left the apartment that she shared with him, and she went towards the river. As she's just innocently walking, Kenneth's plan is anything but innocent. He actually came out of his house that night in order to fulfill his fantasy of abducting and raping a local Okinawan woman. 
and he had a particular person in mind. So he remembered when Rina passed his car, he saw her more clearly. He heard a voice in his head telling him, it's her. She's the one that will fulfill my fantasy. Then he started slowing down in his car, waiting for the two of them to be in a very isolated area. And then he jumped out of the car, he hit Rina on the head with a bar or a rod, it speculated like what particular weapon he used. He stabbed her in the neck with a knife and she fought, this girl fought like a legend. And how we know that this was premeditated is because Kenneth tried forcing her into this suitcase that he has brought along. His brilliant plan, just please listen to this, he is just going to knock her out with a stick, make her lose consciousness, then put her in a suitcase, then go into a hotel, presumably check in like, hey, I'm just here with a suitcase, there's not a live human in it, and then proceed to rape Rina in a hotel room, but then he would just let her leave and let her go after he's done raping her. Like, uh uh-huh. Police officers, they're like, sure. Of course, that seems like a completely legitimate plan. Hmm. But then what he said happened because Rina, of course, was a legend. Like, she must have been, like, into true crime or something because she knew exactly what to do. She tried to defend herself and not let this guy bring her to the secondary location. But Kenneth was spooked by some headlights on the road and he was like, someone's gonna spot what I'm doing. So when he realized that Rina is still alive, he chokes her out and then kind of leaves her on the side of the road, goes back for the suitcase and puts her body in it. The accounts of this are not very clear as to whether or not he actually raped her and whether or not she was alive or dead when this happened, whether she was barely alive or not. But in panic, he brought her into this secluded area and then he realized he must have heard some sounds. He must have heard her gurgle. So he said he stabbed her a couple of more times in order to check that she was alive. Like, that is not how you check for pulse, sir. I don't know what the fuck, what kind of school, what kind of train of thought you're following, but just say that you are a morbid little psycho that just stabbed her to death because you wanted to do it. Don't give me the, I wanted to check if she was alive, so I stabbed her. No, that logic will not make sense to anybody. People believe that he did rape her while simultaneously trying to strangle her and like make her not resist and stab her at the same time. It was just brutal. But once this whole ordeal was done, he just left the body in a suitcase in the middle of nowhere. So when he told the police where to find the suitcase, they all headed out to this wooded location in Ona village of Uso district where they found it. Nearly a month after she went out for that walk. And because of the temperatures, because the suitcase was just exposed to the nature, her body was already a skeleton and she was unrecognizable to people. So they managed to identify her by her dental records. Even though he was forthcoming with a lot of these details, Kenneth couldn't really explain how he disposed of her phone, what he did with the murder weapon, what exactly the murder weapon was. And the police kind of was led to believe that this meant that these two, the murder weapon and the phone, were just discarded like in water waves. He must have just dropped them out of the car because he didn't really care about cleaning his car up like the blood in the car that came off Rina, the DNA that came off her phone, and also the DNA that came from whatever the weapon was. So they just think like he was probably driving and just disposing of these weapons anywhere. Except he tried to pull off something there for a minute by trying to sprinkle salt inside. Who told him? What freaking TV show has he watched to think like, yeah, let's sprinkle salt inside my car? I mean... Again, what I see here is somebody may be trying to claim that they were out of it, trying to like build up a defense, like, hey, I actually can't remember the sequence of events, I can't remember why I'm doing this, I can't remember where I left the murder weapon, where I left her phone, so trying to claim like, actually, I'm not like all right up in there, but mm, is it gonna work, is it? And why I say he might have started building the defense, and this might have been a lot more calculated than we think it is, even though 
I mean, I feel like we all agree it was calculated. The guy had a suitcase and a picture of her on his phone. Like, I don't think we are all arguing on this front in particular. But basically, the police here arrests him for the charges of abandoning a corpse. Already, I have a slight issue with an expression. Like, what you mean? Like, this isn't like a relationship that you have with a corpse to just abandon them on the side. This is not like a child. Like, I don't like the expression. Cool. Cool. So, Kenneth here hires an attorney. And this attorney, Takeshi Takeasu, appealed immediately the admissibility of his confession because he said that the guy was incapable because Kenneth tried to commit suicide by sleeping pill overdose twice before his arrest. So he said like he wasn't all up in there. So his lawyer immediately started using grounds of incapability here. Will this defense work? Well, you have to wait to find out, because let's go briefly into Kenneth's background and what we know about him. We know that Kenneth was born as Kenneth Getson, and he grew up in foster care. During the trial, he is going to come up with a story that he used to hear voices in his head since he was eight years old, that his foster mom abused him, and that due to this abuse, he started fantasizing about killing his mom. The mom denied the abuse. But then he said when he was a teen, the fantasy kind of transferred and he started fantasizing about kidnapping and killing women against their will. So again, quite like Robert Bales we spoke about last week, this guy joined the Marines just for the sake of it. He actually applied for the job of the postal clerk and then progressed to IT, so he was just working within the base. And apparently, according to, again, his trial testimony, what he said during the group interview, he told recruiters that he wanted to join because he wanted to kill people, and the Marines just brushed that off and gave him a job as a postal clerk. Again, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but this is what I have read in different sources. So of course here, because our boy Kenneth had a fantasy about killing people since the very young age that nobody looked into, well now he started fantasizing about shooting his fellow soldiers, his comrades, but he also started fantasizing about them shooting him back. So he kind of turned these ideas inwards as well. And at this point, when we meet him, he is 32, he had been stationed at this island for a couple of years, And he was actually honorably discharged. And the Marine Corps kind of bounced him between the US and Okinawa. So they sent him back to the US in 2011. But then they honorably discharged him. And he returned to Okinawa in 2014. This is when he found a job at Kadena Air Base. And he was working as the IT contractor for them. He married a local woman and actually decided to take her last name, Shinzato. That is why he's known as Kenneth Getson Shinzato. The two of them had a baby. They moved down south to Uruma, to this small seaside town. And it just looked like they were living a completely normal life. That is until that very night when he claimed that on this night he saw the full moon and he knew she was the one who he should attack. He had been fantasizing about this his whole life, but now this was a sign for him. To which I call bullshit, because just think about the premeditation here. He had a suitcase on the ready, he had a picture of her, so he already found her somehow on the internet, on Facebook. And also, he pre-planned the fact that he thought he was going to bring her to the hotel in a suitcase. Remember that whole spiel, where he was going to check in with a body in a suitcase, a live body as well, and then rape her and release her. So, um, yeah, this wasn't really like a full moon situation. This wasn't really, you know, like, I don't know, Twilight, Vampire Diaries. What do you think those shows are about, Maya? What do you think Vampire Diaries is about? Listen, I mean, it's called Vampire Diaries. It's, it's kind of like Gossip Girl, but with vampires, right? You mean Bridget Jones, but with vampires, my Gossip Girl never had, like, a diary. I mean, he kind of kept a diary. <laughs> God. This episode should be freaking titled How Pen Badgley, whatever his name is, traumatized this generation. Truly. <laughs> Truly, we're all scared of guys like him. We're all scared. 
Now that the police had him in custody, we go to trial. And although Kenneth confessed to being responsible for her death and led the police to this area, gave up all of the information, they had all of the DNA, his defense really tried to focus on the motive or the lack thereof, rather. So they have said, again, this will make absolutely zero sense to anybody normal. They have said he set out only to rape the woman, her killing was not premeditated. Therefore, there was no intent. So that doesn't make much fucking sense, does it? Like, you still set out to rape a woman. So, what? Like, oh, you didn't intend to kill her. Okay, cool. Now let's forgive him. Fuck it. Like, let's just move on. Why are we even here? He didn't intend to do any of this. Like, what? <laughs> There's no premeditation. There's no intent. Mm hmm. And his lawyer heavily tried to exploit that sudden surge of his client's idea, like, oh, he's seeing things, he saw the full moon, he has been hearing voices that nobody has ever heard until this very point. Like, this isn't in his medical history, his mom denied, like, the abuse and all of that. So everybody's kind of like, okay, so he doesn't have the medical history and all of this? And the lawyer's like, oh yeah, no, 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 he doesn't. There is no evidence of severe mental illness, but he clearly cannot differentiate between fantasy and reality. I mean, you've heard the guy, right? Right? At the beginning of the trial, the lawyer also tried to argue on his behalf that he will not get a fair trial in Okinawa because of all of the relations that we spoke about between the US and between Okinawa because of the two incidents that we spoke about, one that happened only a month before Rina's murder. But the judge in this case, the judge did not budge. Mm -mm. The judge was such a legend on multiple occasions in this case. So, first of all, he denied this petition straight away to change the trial venue. He was like, ah, not on my fucking watch. Because here, you don't have the military jury. The judges decide on everything. So the judge said the district court judges could be fully counted on to preside over a fair trial. Whatever the particular circumstances in Okinawa and the various thoughts of local residents. He's basically saying that we're the judges, we know the law, we are not going to be biased and shit. Like, you're not really getting in our good books saying that we can't make a rational decision based on the law here. So you kind of fucked yourself over by requesting the venue change here, but sure, yeah, denied. Bye. And now that the judges were like, yeah, let's keep the ball rolling, like the trial is going to happen here, so what do you have for us, defense? So his lawyer started scrambling, he was like, yep, 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 remember how he was on sleeping pills? Yeah, he was under the influence of narcotics following his two suicide attempts. Also, also my client, yeah, he spoke about persistent suicidal fantasies. So he started turning those thoughts of fantasies inwards as well. He started hearing voices since the age of eight. The marine recruiters, they fed these fantasies because they actually wanted him to join the military because he told them he wants to kill people. So this is not on my client. Everybody wanted him to join to kill people. And then Kenneth is there like, don't forget to tell them about the red full moon. And he's like, what? The, the moon was red? Did you say the moon was red? He's like, yeah, red, red full moon. Just make me sound as insane as humanly possible. So this guy was like, it was, the moon was red. Did you hear that? The moon was red. He's clearly not all there in the head. But the prosecution then came with the actual factual evidence, like, you know, like if the defense had the medical history, that might have worked in his favor, but they didn't. So the prosecution was like, here's a suitcase, here's the DNA, here is the picture on his phone that he had of the victim. Case closed, am I right? Should we go to rest? Everybody go to bed? Let's charge this motherfucker. As if that whole ass suitcase in his car, which would have definitely been my mic drop moment, wasn't enough, they actually said, okay, so remember the way that he killed Rina in? So the way that he choked her, that he stabbed her while everything was happening? Well, those were the clear signs that he intended to end her life. He could have just left her on the side of the road when he saw those headlights. He could have let somebody else save her, but he didn't. So regardless whether this was premeditated or not, he could have acted out in a way to save her life, not to end up raping her, not to end up killing her. But again, he didn't. 
And also just to add salt to the wound, you know, the way that he added salt to his car for no motherfucking reason. Well, they said, what about if you don't believe any of this, like if this DNA isn't enough for you, how about the three weeks that the police was looking for this victim, that he knew that she had been killed. He could have spoken up. He could have shown some remorse. But no, he remained silent for three weeks. And that is why we shouldn't have any mercy on him. Maybe had he gone into the police station, yes, reduced his sentence. Fine, like he at least confessed. He felt that he was guilty. He felt that what he has done was wrong. But he hasn't done that. And during the trial, he sort of attempted to show remorse, but it just didn't come across as real or honest. He said in the closing arguments, I'm not a bad person and I didn't mean for any of this to happen. Rina's parents actually called for the death penalty, but they kind of knew that this was rarely applied for a single homicide. So the panel of three judges and six jurors found Kenneth guilty of rape resulting in death and the illegal disposal of a body. And they gave him a life sentence. So he was to spend a life sentence in Yokosuka prison. He has the right to appeal, but this prison is not a joke. It kind of looks like hard labor from what I've seen, and just it looks grim, even just from the outside and like the few pictures that I found about how cells look inside. Prisons in Asia are not a joke. Do not commit crime if this podcast taught you anything, but definitely do not commit crime abroad where you don't know about the prison system. Don't do it yourselves. And this hard labor would include jobs like laundry, cleaning, cooking, metalworking, sewing, making tires, making auto parts. But still, what it means is that he will be forced to work to earn the money to spend within prison. And when reading the verdict, the chief judge Toshishiro Shibata said, The life of the victim, who had just celebrated her adulthood, was suddenly taken and her body was abandoned in the bushes. Her body was not found until it was reduced to bone. Her sorrow is immeasurable. Even giving consideration to the fact that the body was found by the concession of the defendant and he had no previous criminal record, there is no reason to find a lighter sentence than life imprisonment. So when this verdict was published all around the newspapers, of course, people were just fueled by even more rage that this happened again. President Obama just happened to be in Hiroshima for his historic visit in 2016 then, and he had to, well, he was kind of forced to apologize for this crime because it was committed by the U.S. citizen. And the Marine Forces commander also issued formal apologies, and they tried to remedy the situation by imposing a curfew. So they restricted alcohol consumption for a 30-day mourning period. But Okinawan women and feminists were not about it. They were like, okay, cool. So what you're saying that this is going to solve it. Like, first of all, even if you believe that, then what? It's going to solve it for about 30 days. So that's just temporary. And then after 30 days, if they start drinking again, you're saying we're technically in danger again. Like, how the hell is this solving anything? And if you're not saying that, then what you're saying is that people only rape and kill because of the alcohol. They're like, that again, that doesn't make much sense. People wanted a permanent solution, and all of the posters called for the removal of the US bases as soon as possible. Protesters took to the streets and they organized a demonstration involving 65,000 people who wore black armbands to symbolize the Okinawan Solidarity Movement. And Okinawan's women's groups really did some great job to point out that this murder was just like the one in 1995, just like the one that happened a month before Rina's death, the result of the unequal protection of U.S. troops when they commit these heinous crimes against their local women. They pointed to this process of masculinization that involved stripping American servicemen of their previous identity, and in order to rebuild them to these macho characters once they're in military that need to fight enemies. And only by doing that, by becoming a man, they would become a true soldier who is fit for the operations of the war. 
they would say that even during the basic training program, the U.S. military would provide these lessons in masculinity and they would call male recruits girls and ladies. So yet again, when you come with that mindset into every single case that we cover during this military murder month, it is very easy to understand how when they see the men that are in the army, but they're just new to it, these new recruits, as girls and ladies and lesser than, how easy it is for them to see actual women as less than. The anti-US demonstrations in Okinawa and Tokyo were followed by formal protests by the Japanese government in the US. And this is when we need to speak about the Japan Status of Forces Agreement that we're going to call SOFA, because that's what it's known as, as the acronym, from now on. So, SOFA until this point in 2016 would exempt most US military members from Japanese visa and passports laws. And as if that wasn't enough, the laws didn't change much from 1995. If a U.S. member of the service was suspected of the crime, but not captured outside of his base by the Japanese authorities, the U.S. authorities could still retain custody until the service member is formally indicted, so within courts, by the Japanese. So this prolongs everything, and Japanese authorities objected that they still don't have the regular access to question or to interrogate the U.S. service members, making it difficult for the prosecutors to prepare cases, and obviously making it difficult to get the justice for the victims. It just prolongs everything for them. So it was about the time for the change to be made. And because of Rina's case, on 16th of January 2017, Japan and the US signed a supplementary agreement that was to limit and clarify the definition of the civilian component protected under the Status of Forces Agreement. What this meant was a couple of things. The first one was that the contractors must fit at least one of the five qualifications in order to be considered part of the civilian component protected under SOFA. So these qualifications that Kenneth here would have fallen under would include those who acquired knowledge and skills via higher education, those who had security clearance, and you had to also had the license by the US government, those who stayed in the country less than 91 days for an emergency mission, and those who would be authorized by the Japan-US Joint Committee. This also introduced a new process where the US government had to notify Tokyo of contractors that are protected by SOFA so that they know. So if somebody like this was to commit crime, they can sort of have the checklist. So they can be like, this man doesn't fall under any of these categories. They don't have these qualifications. They aren't protected by this extension of the agreement. Then the Japanese and Okinawans forces can just proceed as normal as if they were just the Japanese citizens. They don't have that extra protection by the US. So this made it harder for any private contractor to actually officially be invited to go and work in Japan, because now they needed to fall under the clause of having the essential right to the mission of the United States Armed Forces have a degree of skill or knowledge for the accomplishment of mission requirements. So that's about the change that has been brought. I would like if anybody is listening from Japan or Okinawa in particular to let me know whether this has made any difference now about five years have passed because it doesn't sound like super strong to me. It sounds like kind of just like we spoke in that drunk history lesson. It sounds kind of like a compromise, like, oh yeah, we will, you know, move the nuclear weapons to like another base sort of in the secluded area of the town and you're like, mm, does that really help? It kind of sounds like, hey, it's an extension, but does it really do much in terms of crimes? It would be great if it does. I hope it does. I hope all of these crimes bring like the pioneer laws and everything, but does it? That's what I want to know. As for our boy Kenneth, well, he of course appealed a few times from what I know, but in 2018, he reached again a free judges panel and the judges, the judges love shutting this guy down. Any single judge, they were all different judges, but they have like killer quotes in this case. The judge called Masamichi Okubo in this case said uh, there were no issues found with the original judgment. 
the credibility of the confession was recognized and therefore it was appropriate. The defendant recognized each action had a high risk to kill the victim, therefore he had intended to do it. So that appeal was denied and he is in prison. Until further notice, until maybe he appeals again and might have more success. But I highly, highly doubt it because certain cases are just there to go down in history. And this, I feel, was one of them. So what do we feel really motivated this guy? Except from like the red full moon, of course. Of course, that is a very serious motive. <laughs> it's a very serious motivation. The guy saw a moon. In. We, we speak about it every week, 72 cases. People were like, whoa, moons, they affect me a lot. <laughs> imagine. Imagine if that was like a legitimate defense. It must be. It must be. Some freak must have actually convinced their defense attorney to be like, no. Convince them I see a moon and I become a werewolf. Here in particular, in this case, I focused mostly on the motivations for rape. Because we know he fantasized about this from when he was younger. And then in particular, in the past couple of years before committing this crime. And that night he left his abode. He left his house full well knowing that he is about to attack somebody. So from what we know about motivations surrounding rape cases, it is that they are usually motivated by some form of aggression, incorporating power, violence, revenge, and anger. There was a study dating back to 1985 by Scully and Marola that revealed that some rapes are considered both punishment and revenge that are directed at the victims because these victims were considered to be responsible for any of the their rapist problems. But the new studies have actually found that motivations can be varied and that there are actually six different forms of rape. There is a random blitz attack, specific blitz, pack or ceremonial, white collar, friendship and family rapes. Here I believe we are talking specific blitz because he didn't like stalk the victim but he still had the target and then he still specifically that night went out seeking for a victim and then she just happened to come upon. So I don't think this was random. I think the 1995 was the pack or the ceremonial one which are the weirdest cases like the New Delhi rape case falls under this category as well. I just don't understand when men decide to do this together. I'm like, how do you feel good? Like, how do you feel anything about yourself after this? And well, this one won't fall under the friendship, family or white collar rapes. And Bandura's social learning theory actually explored that the use of force is the main characteristic that is present during any of these six different forms of rape, suggesting that aggression is the primary motivation for it. And in particular, I feel like the protesters and the feminists actually made a great point here, because I think that this is partially at least motivated by this guy being in the military, by how they're trained, by the combination of the aggression and also the sexual expression that resulted from the extension of this traditional male role. How do you see women once you have been incorporated into the system, you have been taught how to be this macho male powerful figure and how you see everybody else as like being beneath you. I feel like that was a prevalent theme throughout these three cases where in each one they have seen the women as lesser than them. Robert Bales in particular didn't have issue with women but he had issues with other humans that he saw as less than him. So in his mind he justified it in that way because he's American, he's the superior class. The same happens here. It's not just between the US and Japan and the power dynamic there, but it's also between the power dynamic of the genders. And one crucial thing that I think we don't think enough about when it comes to motivations for rape in particular is that usually they're motivated by aggression, like these fantasies and then like how they're displayed. They're not motivated by desire for sexual gratification. And that's one thing that was prevalent here, like did he actually rape Rina or like did he not? And the fact that that is not 100% clarified might actually come from Kenneth himself in a sense that he might not have cared. So it was all about the aggression and actually fulfilling his fantasy 
rather than him reaching any form of gratification out of this. So what can we conclude after the three cases of military murder? I put, somebody save us from the men that feel powerless. Please, somebody save women from the men that are just like, ooh, I feel like I'm powerless today, let me attack. But... On a serious note, in all of these cases, there was some power over. In all three of them, the perpetrators were either discharged or have had fixations over committing rape or killing those who they saw as less than. There is a code of serve and protect when you join the military that makes those who join feel like they have to act tough. Yet there is a fine line between killing as part of your service and killing to fulfill your own agenda. Keep making this world a better place, one motive at a time, and I will see you here in four days. Uh, goodbye, fuckers.